And I think many of us, uh, in the, in the many years we've been on the stage for a long time, always coming up with kind of clever ideas uh, uh, on various things like earthquake engineering. We'll hear those today. Um, Steve just finished up his tenure as a number of years as the uh, director of the Pier Earthquake Engineering Research Center. So, Steve, we'd like to have a good Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here in such a large crowd and see um, a very diverse group coming from city officials, to urban planners, to architects, to engineers, to people who are talking about exterior lights, or I guess are structural engineers, but uh, I, I don't get to play with that except for Christmas lights on trees, and uh, I try to uh, watch out for getting too high up on the ladder that way. But anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I thank the uh, sponsors of the organization for holding this and inviting me. What I wanted to do is talk today a little bit about some work that I have been working on along with some of my students, uh, Sean Sean Wong and Vincent Shao, who are in the audience here, and so they can answer any of the difficult questions you might ask later. Um, uh, but to talk a little bit about our work looking at how to uh, economically and efficiently achieve greater resilience in tall buildings. And uh, just as a way of doing, uh, I don't know how to, uh, uh, as far as a disclaimer, uh, given this is sort of a Tongji love fest, uh, I actually am a 111 and guest professor at Tongji University as well as being a professor at Berkeley. And Sean Chan and Ben are uh, graduates of Tongji University's undergraduate program, and so uh, there's close relationships between Berkeley and Tongji, as well as uh, lots of other people. Uh, the other is I really like tall buildings. I've been working on big things uh, for a long, long time, and uh, I, I take that sort of seriously since I now live in a tall building. And uh, an old one, this was uh, the tallest three first concrete building west of the Rockies for many, many years, and it's not so now. And it's not really tall because uh, if you uh, look at Shanghai, which we've seen pictures, uh, there is sort of the old tall, and there's the new tall, and there's yet to be new tall, as we've talked about before. But uh, my building is uh, less than a third of the height of any of these buildings in the picture from Shanghai. And uh, there's taller buildings in California under construction, which you've seen some information about. Uh, but these are only about halfway between my building and the ones in Shanghai. So eventually we will get up there, but in Shanghai and elsewhere, they'll be even taller, I would imagine. But uh, we can see that bigger buildings are coming in California, and so what do we want to do with them in case there's an earthquake? Um, having said that, tall is a challenge in its own right. We're tying gravity at a high up in the air. But architects are coming up with more and more creative and challenging structural forms. A lot of these forms are very useful for things like wind resistance, uh, and so that uh, there are structural reasons for them other than aesthetics. Uh, and so uh, we have to figure out how to deal with things like that, and performance-based earthquake engineering is a vehicle for dealing with that, since building codes won't normally treat those kinds of things well. And so there's a number of performance-oriented guidelines for the design of tall buildings, including one that is widely used in uh, California and other places that was put out by the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. In passing, that document is currently being revised, and a new version of it should be up by the end of the year. Uh, and uh, we'll see what that entails. But uh, the heart of performance-based design is basically, from an engineering point of view, saying what you want to do and have your building do, uh, and then verifying that. So you look at a, a frequent and occasional, a rare and very rare seismic event, and then say whether you want to be back in your building immediately or soon, or you just are glad to be alive after the earthquake, or you're really glad to be alive uh, because the building is sort of hanging in there. And so typically buildings are designed for dealing with what you would see along the diagonal where it says uh, basic objective along here. And an engineer then would do an analysis, sort of a code level kind of design uh, and analysis, not looking at all the details of the code or descriptive requirements, but seeing that it would work, then checking for serviceability level, for low level earthquake, and then making sure the structure is stable for a really large earthquake. 
So one of the things then is what performance level do you want to have? Just something that is hanging in there or something that's uh, occupiable and you can sh shelter in place following an earthquake or something that's immediately occupiable. And so the building code, the basic building code of ASCE 7 gives some guidance on that and they have sort of an ordinary building which is a seismic risk category 2. But if you look further down in the table that they give, it says that if you have a building that uh, its failure could pose a substantial risk to human life or to, uh, cause potential uh, economic impact or mass disruption of the day-to-day -day civilian life of a community, uh, you should use something which is a higher performance level and that if there's something that poses a substantial hazard to a community, you would do something even uh, higher in performance level. And to my knowledge, most designs of tall buildings in California are really done for seismic risk category uh, 2 for performance-based design. And there's an underlying question that I like to raise is whether or not that is something that is reasonable. If you look at ASC 7 and go to the appendices uh, where they talk about the commentary, there's a little graph that lists uh, along one of its axes uh, the number of people at risk number of occupants of a building, and the seismic risk category, and at least my building that I live in has something on the order of 3,000 people live in it. I look at this graph, uh, it's a short building now, and, and you look at this graph, it's clearly right in the middle of uh, the seismic risk category 3 and nudging toward 4. Uh, if I look at some of these bigger buildings, they have you know, four and five to 10,000 people in them, and one might presume that they should be seismic risk category four. It's a question of what is a substantial number of people and what is a substantial economic loss. So, to me, anything over $10 is substantial. To other people, it's uh, $10 billion. So, uh, that's a matter of discussion. But clearly, we don't want to have a building collapse. And so, ultimately, we have to have collapse safety. And it's not always true that around the world that tall buildings haven't collapsed. These are not essentially the 60-story buildings, but uh, these are older buildings, and they were designed at a period of time, most of them, when we don't know what we do now. But we don't know today what we will know 20 years from now either. So there's a little bit of hubris, I think, sometimes it goes on. But these are designed today so that we think there's a 90% confidence that they do not collapse if you have a fairly rare earthquake. That earthquake has a 2% probability of occurring or being exceeded in 50 years. And so that earthquake is fairly rare, and we're looking at a high confidence of doing that. But I would get in an airplane um, over my lifetime, which is you know, greater than 50 years, <laughs> if it had a 2%, a 90% confidence of falling out of the sky. Uh, I just wouldn't do that. And so we get in buildings all the time, and so we're just hoping that we are very conservative in all of our assumptions that we might, might make there. But Lucy Jones and Keith Porter are very fond of going around and saying, well, if you design everything perfectly and you have your maximum considered earthquake and if you have a thousand buildings, this would mean that ten of them you would be acceptable, you would be acceptable for ten to collapse. And if you had one collapse, there's generally fourteen times more buildings that would be red tagged and another four times more that would be yellow tagged. If they take fourteen times four, I get about sixty most percent of the buildings in an area subjected to the design, the maximum considered level earthquake that would have limited <coughs> occupancy, which would, according to the modern building codes, we're saying that 60% of San Francisco would be not able to have people occupy the buildings. I mean, that's just, that's just what it says from an engineering point of view, whether that happens and whether I believe that happens is something else. Okay? So, going beyond the life safety, we have seen in Chile, at least from Chile, or uh, New Zealand, that tall buildings, even if there's no structural damage, there's no structural damage in any of these buildings that I have pictures of, have tremendous amounts of non-structural damage. These wonderful ceilings over our heads here are not the gem of structural engineering that we think that the underlying steel structure is. 
And if you have this kind of damage, we're not going to be back in here next week for uh, a lecture series uh, in this building. And so there's going to be some disruption even if the building is fine. And so there's been a lot of work over the last decade or two looking at performance-based design. And if we look at FEMA P58, there's a lot of information about how to estimate casualties and downtime and economic loss. There's new work on business interruption loss. And you can calculate sort of return on investment now as to if you put in so much money, how long does it take to pay that off uh, given the likely damage you would have in future earthquakes. Uh, and this can be used in a design fashion. This is basically a static pushover analysis for economic loss. It's just taking larger and larger displacements on the structure and seeing what the damage is. It's not what the developers of the program had in mind. But I can say if I wanted 10% of limit the damage uh, uh, to, the non to the total building to 10% repair costs, <coughs> and I wanted to limit it to 10% of the replacement cost of the building, I could come across, come down and say I didn't want more than one and a quarter percent interstory drift, like that. And I can use that as a design criteria for my building. But when I go out to that level, uh, there's absolutely no structural damage at that point. The structural damage is the dark blue and the medium-sized blue in there. All of that is non-structural stuff, the stuff that's hanging from the ceiling here. And I can do the same thing for acceleration, and the kick to this is that the majority of professors at Stanford and at Berkeley and elsewhere have gone through and studied and have come to relatively uniform conclusion that much of the cost of damage to new buildings comes from damage to non-structural elements, to business interruption costs, and to costs associated with large residual displacements of the building, not because the building is anywhere in danger of falling down. But those percentages can be like 70 or 80 percent of the total cost of the, of the building. And at that point, your insurance company will not pay to rebuild your building. If you get over 40 percent, the building is normally considered a total loss. And so a lot of buildings are just going to sit there until somebody figures out how to tear them down, because you might have to fix them in order to tear them down, like that. And you have to figure out who's going to pay for a new building. In that regard, out of Napa, out of New Zealand, out of Chile, there's something else that is new. And that is, if you have an earthquake and you have a bunch of buildings that are shaken, some of them are going to be red tagged that are leaning over heavily damaged, and some of them are not going to have so much damage, so you're going to get a green tag. But if I have a tall building and it happens to be red tagged like that, there is now an International uh, um, uh, what is it? ICB uh, community, community com 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 conference of building officials. Uh, uh, the advisory that says if a building a building is leaning more than one percent, it's presumptive that it has uh, a red tag uh, associated with it, and that all buildings within the height of the building would be red tagged as well because that building is just all over him. Okay, so that all of these buildings out here, uh, below this building that are green tag, now become red tag. Right? So, uh, who sues whom in this situation? It's just going to be a field day for lawyers, and I should go back to law school by a time. The, uh, this, I'm not saying anything about a particular building here, but the implication of this is here, and I don't know what the city of San Francisco is going to do, but if this building falls could fall over and hit the other building, that building could fall over and hit another building, and pretty soon, like Domino's, San Francisco would be closed down overnight in 15 minutes. And so there are some things where life safety and collapse prevention may not be adequate, and this whole building issue brings us into sort of a point of, of uh, great consideration, I think. So the question is, a structural engineer, it's like I can complain about all this stuff, but how do you fix it? And so this is whether we can start doing not just buildings that are really ductile and collapse resistant, but can we do buildings which are uh, damage resilient or damage resistant? And so going back to capacity design, we try to have localized regions where damage would concentrate make everything else so that it's elastic and not damaged, make the places that are likely to be damaged easy to access, inspect, and repair, like that. Um, then um, from a structural engineering point of view, 
we can just start making things ductile or we can start making non-structural elements really super. And there's too many of those and I have too little time left to worry about all the possible things that one could fix. But I could try to figure out how to make structural systems a little bit better. And in that regard, then systems that would limit accelerations and displacements and recenter are things that are good. And so we've been looking at things which then recenter self centering systems or viscous damping or buckling restraint braces or viscous wall dampers or seismic isolation in particular. This is not unique to me. Uh, this is something from ARA, but uh, many buildings have cores in them, and you can put in buckling restraint braces like GQ Lee said, or you can put in uh, viscous dampers in outriggers like this uh, to try to improve the behavior of tall buildings. But again, if the concrete building that I lived in had a sheer wall, that's not me. Um, and I came home after the, the earthquake, and right at the base of the building is where the plastic hinge would happen in the elevator cores. I would come in and would have all of these nice cracks. Excuse me, the building didn't collapse, and it behaved the way it was supposed to. It would have big cracks, the cover would fall off, the bars might be buckled, but it wouldn't have collapsed. And I would say, should I push the elevator button to get into the building? Most likely the building official was already there and they would have red tagged the building because it acted like a plastic hinge. And so the question is, is a sheer wall that has a plastic hinge at the bottom of it an ideal thing to put in a building? And so I'm sort of a detective at heart. So can you make a plastic hinge that doesn't have any damage in it? So my idea, it's not unique to me, is to not have the sheer wall to the ground, reinforce the bottom of it, and put some sort of boot on the bottom of it so it's not damaged, and let it rock. And then put some energy dissipation devices in it by taking isolators and putting them in the vertical direction and push tension into the ground uh, to uh, help it recenter. You could put in buckling restrained braces or viscous dampers in there to get energy dissipation. But the idea is that this would just open up as a mechanical device, close down as a mechanical device after the earthquake, you wouldn't see there was any damage. And if you had to fix something, you would swap out the buckling restrained braces like that. And the architect could paint them yellow or chrome them, put them inside the wall, hide them, uh, put an ivy on them. I don't care, but it wouldn't have damage in it. Uh, the main thing is that these have hysteretic loops that look like the flag-shaped hysteretic loop on the left hand, right hand side of the graph. And if I put outriggers to help the structure, uh, we can put in viscous dampers, we can put in buckling restrain braces, we put viscous dampers and buckling restrain braces, but if the buckling restrain braces yield, they have a permanent offset to them. And so, in the same way that we do now, recentering shear walls. In buildings, I could easily see that we just take a recenter and show walls, turn it 90 degrees, and have a recentering outrigger. Okay, so that would help the, this kind of system recenter. So that uh, there's lots of people working on core wall buildings and doing testing and lots and lots of analysis, and so there's no real profit for me to work in that area. So we've been doing most of the work recently on buildings that don't have. Uh, core walls in them, and part of that is just most of the core walls are really, really gigantic as you go taller and taller and eating up more of the floor space. And so we're looking more at systems that where you could use moment frames or some type of frame that is distorted, uh, like you see in many of the architects that, uh, architectural drawings now. So this is actually an existing building in downtown San Francisco. It's 35 stories tall, the building's anonymous. And um, it is subjected to two earthquakes represented uh, by two hazard levels. One is a 20% 50 year event, and the other one is a 5% 50 year event. The ground motions were generated by Jack Baker here at Stanford. And uh, we've been doing some analysis of that building using open seas, using ASE 41. And basically, this building, which was designed for a very good engineer in San Francisco in the late 1960s. Um, basically fails to satisfy the basic minimum collapse prevention performance objectives as laid out in ASC B41. It forms a soft story in the, near the bottom third of the building, and there's a high percentage of beam-to-column connections that rupture in the um, 
20% and 50 are men, and most of the bean pollen connections fail uh, in the more rare event. In addition to that, the colonizing loads are extremely high, up at 90 or 95 percent of their capacity in many of the earthquakes. And so it seems that some retrofit would be desirable uh, uh, for either a moderate or fairly severe earthquake. And so we've been looking at several different ways of doing this. At what level do you want to make the building safe? How safe is safe enough is an underlying question. And then how resilient is resilient enough is a second question. But these buildings have a lot of details that are prevalent in pre-Northridge uh, structures. And one of those is that the column splices are not adequate. Uh, in the original design, there was no tension ever in these connections. And so they didn't bother to put really big welds in the column splices. And now if you put in real earthquakes and do nonlinear analysis, you find out that there, there are substantial tension forces in the, in the columns. The other retrofit as part of this stage one, the cheap level <coughs> retrofit that we looked at is just to, to remove the cladding. The cladding is a concrete panel with a marble uh, or granite uh, facade on it. it the, the cladding weighs 23% of the total weight of the building. So you could make the building effectively much stronger by simply getting rid of the cladding. This has been done by others, so this is not a novel idea. Yeah, this is a building in San Francisco. There's another building in San Francisco that had the same thing done. And you just replace the really heavy cladding with something that is a light curtain wall, and uh, your building magically becomes stronger as a percentage of its weight automatically. So you just put the building on the diet. The second is, if you wanted to do better, we looked at putting in all kinds of viscous dampers, and I'm going to present results here for one case, where there's about 172 dampers put in these buildings, the average damper capacity is like 700,000 pounds, so these are not small dampers, has 8% viscous damping and 13% viscous damping in the two orthogonal directions of the building because it's not quite symmetric. And so uh, the uh, damper distribution is putting them mostly down near the bottom of the building where the building has more trouble and, and then lightening them up as you go up in the building. And given the fact that there's many really strong dampers and because there is a lot of force that has to be transferred through lots of connections, in our current work we're looking at exoskeletons for retrofit, but going to new buildings where we have sort of mega braces uh, with viscous and buckling restrained dampers in, in them. And that's, again, not something new to us, but we're looking at it in a fairly systematic way. So if we want to evaluate this kind of thing using something like FEMA P58, we go through and do analysis, and this is for the lower level, the, the basically 225-year event, if you're an engineer. Uh, but the as-built uh, has this soft story that happens in there. It's not just one story, but several stories. When it gets out to 10% uh, drift, 10% drift in a 10-story building is one foot. Uh, so it's not a small displacement like that. And all of the connections fracture, all the column splices fracture in those levels like that. So it's not good news. If you go through pink of 358, it basically says that you have to do full replacement of the building. And in addition to the replacement of the building, have then five years that the building's not occupied, so the owner's not collecting money during that time, so there's a business interruption cost that go along with that. If you do just the removing the cladding, fix the column splices, you get this stage one retrofit, and that's the blue line uh, on the left-hand side, and so that gets rid of the soft story. Good result there. And the economic losses that you would have are sort of in the middle little bar there. And there's some structural repair, and there's some uh, business interruption costs. And if I put in the viscous dampers, I can get rid of the uh, uh, repair costs pretty much, but um, the middle one probably works okay. But if I go to the 5% 50 year event, it's not the 2% 50 year event you would have to do for a new building, but I go to the 5% 50 year event, what I see is that the, day, the fixing the column splices, taking the cladding is not good enough. We get the blue line in there, it makes it better, but not particularly excellent. And if I put in the dampers, then it's pretty good. So the question is, how good is good enough? And that's a decision that the city has to make, and the owner has to make, and the engineer has to sleep at night.
So, um, and so uh, there's all kinds of uh, structural engineering questions as well as public policy questions. So anyway, we're trying to use this as a mechanism for examining what are the performance goals of tall buildings. Uh, if you're going to have a resilient building, is that resilient for a 2,500-year uh, event? Is that resilient for a 500-year event? Is it resilient for a 200-year event? And, and so I think that's a philosophical decision. Uh, we're trying to optimize the damper characteristics, uh, both in terms of distributing them and having naked uh, dampers uh, along the perimeters of the building, and uh, looking at uh, how we might incorporate the dampers into a wind uh, a, a, a aspect of the design as well. Um, I've also done a lot of work on seismic isolation. This is a test I did in 2013 with Kerry Bryant at the University of Reno at the Eat Event Shaping Table. The ground is moving back and forth about a meter. But the little blue line that goes down the middle of the screen is basically a stationary line, and we were just floating in space inside the structure. That's what you would do. But the building is only moving back and forth about six inches at that point. But the ground is moving back and forth a meter. So seismic isolation, if you draw it as a structural engineer, the building seems to be going way over here, the way over here, the way over here. It's really that the ground is moving way over here, over here, way over there, and the building is trying to stay wherever it was in between. And so that seemed to be good if we're trying to protect the contents of the building, like people. And uh, so we did a really simple study so far. We've gotten some drawings for some buildings from our friends at SOM that we're going to try to do for real buildings, but we looked at a 30-story moment resisting frame that's a real building in Japan. We did a real simple stick model, and then we looked at triple pendulum bearings with a lot of different parameters. Basically, we get very similar results for lead rubber bearings, but the triple pendulum bearings allow us to systematically change things and get real things pretty quickly. We looked at the same site as the other building in downtown San Francisco, except we did it for new buildings, so we looked at 50% in 50 years, in 30 years, 10% in 50 years, and 2% in 50 years uh, for the earthquake hazard. If you look at this, basically the black line on the far right hand side or the left hand side graph here, I don't know how to do the pointer here, is what the drifts would be for a fixed phase case, and they're about 1.6%. That's not a bad drift uh, in terms of safety and ductility demands on the structure. And if I base isolate it and I look at the base case that I had, uh, I get the red line in here. And um, it's about a third of what the fixed base case would be. So I can go down to that level of force in a fixed base building by making it ductile. And I'd have a ductility of maybe three, which is not a large number, but I'd have damage in the building. If I isolate it, I can reduce the forces by a factor of three, and the drifts by a factor of three, and I don't have any damage. So it's a, a philosophical question here. Um, the isolators then are basically eating up the, the there is the, the um, let's just say pointer. Aha. So uh, if I have a fixed space building, the drift moves up like that. And if I have an isolated case, the isolator moves over and the center of mass tries to stay basically where it's at. And the building just basically, the bottom of the building kicks over this way and the top of the building comes back. And so if the building is getting straighter and straighter and straighter, the more flexible I make the isolator, the longer period that I have for the isolator. And so the, the more flexible, the longer period isolator has drifts that are down here, less than a half a percent over here compared to one and a half percent or so for the fixed pace case. Uh, the shear goes down by a third, and the accelerations in the building go down far more than a third, and they look sort of like this. So if you have expensive Waterford crystal in your bookcases, in your condo uh, here, um, it's more likely that they won't fall out of the, the case, uh, or your wine won't be shaken up so much. I don't mean to be, to be facetious about this, but why not? Um, so, uh, engineers love floor response spectra, and you see the same thing, that uh, the fixed space looks like this, comes up here to, uh, what is that wonderful number, 6G? No, 3.5, is that? That looks like 7 to me. Yeah, all right, so that's 6G, something like 6G in there. 6G is where you black out if you're a fighter pilot. 
No? Uh, it was, it, it, and if I let it yield, it would come down here, but it would be damaged. But if I isolate it, it, it gets it down here to 2G, which is something that's still large. Uh, but for you know, the fixed base case, or the, just the force acceleration, it drops down here to sort of like a third of a G, like that. Not, not a huge number in that case. So if I look then at not the, just the design level, this two, the 500-year earthquake, but I go up to the 2,500-year earthquake, I get this, about the same thing. The drifts here are a little bit bigger. It goes from like a half a percent up to like one and a quarter percent drift, which is you know, maybe something we'd start getting some damage. And the isolator displacements get out to maybe three feet, like that. So big number, but the Stanford Hospital, I think, is up like three feet of uh, uh, displacement in the in escalators that are there. Same kind of behavior, same benefit in reducing the floor level accelerations like that. So there's two properties, sort of the, the effective stiffness of an isolator. Uh, so we also have the friction capacity of the isolator. People make a big thing out of how the friction coefficient is and how accurate it is. Basically, in my experience, it makes almost no difference in the response, and this is sort of the drift that you would get for all the isolated systems versus the um, uh, fixed base case. Accelerations uh, drop down from this level for fixed base and come over here. What this graph has in it is the older uh, single pendulum bearings, which are bilinear in shape. And many people try to make the new triple pendulum bearings look bilinear. And what you can see is that there's no difference in the maximum displacement between the single and triple pendulum bearings like this for the drifts, at least in our calculations. But the accelerations at the floor levels are greatly benefited by the triple pendulum bearings because the history groups down over and don't have a little sharp bilinear corner in them. And so uh, I think that if you're worried about acceleration sensitive equipment in a building or uh, Waterford crystal or wine, uh, I would definitely use you know, triple pendulum bearings like that. Um, Rather than going up and looking at the big earthquake, let's look at this 42-year earthquake. And the, the stronger the bearings, the more traditional bearings that you would have, uh, may not isolate uh, for a low-level earthquake. There's been a hospital in Southern California that I understand people have complained after the Northridge earthquake or the San Fernando earthquake that said, uh, well, it didn't isolate because it didn't have much acceleration and things fell out of cabinets and the like. And the engineers said, well, it would have if the earthquake was only bigger. And so these triple pendulum bearings have a friction coefficient like 1%. And so you get a little earthquake and they start moving around quite a bit. And so the fixed base looks like this. The single pendulum bearings look like this in terms of sorting earth ratio. But the uh, triple pendulum bearings look sort of like this over here are reduced, and so there's a great benefit, even for these little earthquakes, which are maybe annoying and not so damaging, but if you're paying the $16 million for a condo on a you know, 60th floor or someplace, you know, I'd rather, I know which building I would rather live in. No? So anyway, uh, there is a lot of technology out there to help us make buildings more resilient and allow people to go back in and shelter in place in them after a major earthquake. I think tall buildings become the most appropriate place to look at this because the buildings represent a substantial investment of money, of material, just the quantities of, of material that go into them, and the intellectual the best engineered buildings, uh, structures, I think, out there in the world uh, that people put a lot of attention into and we ought to make them what is the best of our engineering ability. They're occupied by lots of, lots of people and very important corporations and organizations. And uh, as was discussed this morning, they are icons of what humanity is all about, what a system, what a city is all about, the, all the stuff in the forest floor underneath the uh, canopy, you know, and all the stuff that comes around them. He's just walking downtown. I was talking to John King on the bus, um, and it was just how lively San Francisco is because of all the tall buildings. People have a nightlife in San Francisco now that they didn't have uh, 20 years ago, for the most part. And so uh, if there's some way that we can protect them, uh, that would be good, I think. 
it's reasonable, in my mind, that we try to design tall buildings to enhance seismic performance considering the broader's uh, uh, resilience, sustainability, and economic issues that are involved. So there's got to be some balances there, which, which I can't make the, that decision. And, uh, but I do know that a lot of these advanced protective systems ideas using isolation or viscous dampers or mass dampers or something like that can help us protect the structural and non-structural elements and the contents from damage. And I think there's lots of opportunities for everybody to work together, particularly between practitioners and owners and researchers. To develop new innovative structure and architects, I should not uh, leave architects out of this. Uh, absolutely, shouldn't leave them out. Uh, but to develop new structural systems that will support this novel or interesting or innovative, new creative architectural expression uh, and the contents of those structures and integrate them in an earthquake engineering. Thank you.